Oh, now I have to think of something to say. You don't have to. <laughs> I never you know what you're going to do. Try and skip over me, I dare you. I'll interrupt you. <laughs> this is the Bub Show. All right. Bob Ready? couldn't make it today. In five, four, three... Yo, welcome to the Bub and Bob Show, where we have rare conversations with compelling Christians. At least that's what we try to do. If I don't <laughs> screw it up, it usually happens. I am Bub Coons. Over there, uh, what, switching knobs and turning little things like the great and powerful Oz himself is yes. uh, Bob Matosian. Actually, we're going with the Bob and Bub Show now. Okay. <laughs> yeah. No, no big deal. No big you deal. want top billing? That's 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 great. It's the B and B. Yeah, it's going to end up being that anyway. Yes, it's like Federal Express I became Story FedEx. Bros. I hear is a new, uh, and, and not brothers, but bros. So, yeah, everyone's it's, calling the Story Bros. Yeah, yeah. So maybe we switch it to that. We have quite a following. We've got a lot of folks in the studio. Today, I know this so, is exciting. We have yeah. all kinds of uh, of people behind there doing shooting things and good friends of ours from the past who were paying heavily. Yeah, <laughs> you know, because we got just an unending budget here. So don't make any did. noise. No. <laughs> All right, there, there they are, there the people go. in the background. All right, back to you. Back to me. Our <laughs> guest today is a New York Times best-selling author. He's wrote written a lot of really good books, including what has been known now as the Killing series. He wrote with Bill O'Reilly. You probably heard of him or seen him. There's Killing Patton. There's Killing Kennedy. There's one we're going to talk about is Killing Jesus. Somehow he still tries. He doesn't try. He finds time to be a coach and be a dad and be a husband. This is the skillfully industrious. And may I may I add? <laughs> Wonderfully personable, <laughs> Martin Dugard. <laughs> Welcome to the Bub and Bob Show. Nice to be back. Yeah, again. <laughs> yeah. So now we, the, the cat's out of the bag. Marty was here before, and there was technical issues. We've had him back. Thanks for graciously coming back. My pleasure. I think it busy. was host issues actually. Was it me? Yeah. 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 I was out of focus. Is that my? Is that was? That was yeah. Me? You you must have leaned back. Yeah, I leaned back and moved forward. Well, w- welcome back. Thanks for coming. Like so, really, I had a great time last time. And good. I look forward. Well, hopefully, to it's just more. It's, it's better. Hopefully, it's better. even even better. Uh, one of the things we like to do is kind of go back in time and tell me when you first encountered Christ and, and that, that your kind of journey uh, through that whole thing. And, oh, well, you know, I don't know, it's been kind of a lifelong thing with me. I mean, I was I was raised as a Catholic and um, I was an altar boy, you know, and I was, you know, I think I was seven or eight, you know, and there's a great moment um, before Mass every time, we're, we're about 20 minutes before Mass, the altar boys will go out and light all the candles mm-hmm. on the altar and throw out the, you know, the, on the altar everything around it and um usually the church is empty you know that's and that's when it happens and for some reason for me i would go out there and light those candles and i would i don't know seven years old you know who knows what you know but i felt the presence of god and i always kind of felt like it's like hey it's just you and me god was like this one-on-one like we're bros Mm -hmm. Not a story, bro, yeah, yeah, but a bro. You know, <laughs> only a few, few people and, can be story bros. Yeah, yeah. So throughout my life, whenever, even in my, you know, wilderness years, you know, I, I never felt far away from God. Right. I always felt like God was there. I never felt like we walked separately. Yeah. Um, and then you know, it's just it's it's nice to get to a certain point in your life where you mature in that faith. Sure. And that's where, yeah. been, and I like that process right now. Yeah. That was similar to me. I was an acolyte in the Episcopal church yeah. around the same age and 10 or 11 years old. And what's an acolyte? It's kind of like an altar boy. Okay. All right. Yeah. It's the same guy. You, you, you help the priest yeah. and you, you know, and you, you do the sacraments and you come out and yeah. have your little candle, candle things and you light them and snuff them out at the end of the, the service. And you know, it's yeah, just a thing. practice, same, same, thing, same yeah. exact thing. It's All just, boys though. Yeah, they're all boys. Okay. No, you can, you can do, girls do it now. Do oh, they do it now? Yeah. Well, when I was it's there, no one, yeah. it was like 100% Things have ma- changed. male-driven. Yes, Things yeah. have changed. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, but the same thing. I always had this uh, this feeling or yeah. this, uh, the, the presence of God was there. I was, ne- I, was, I was not sold out or nor did I put my trust in Christ yet, yeah. but I knew that there was a God and he was close to me. Right. And then the rest yeah. of that kind, that kind of came. Do you remember when... It was a point where you're like, okay, I'm taking this, I'm taking this seriously, and you know, I, I believe the Bible is the word of God, and it's time to go. Okay, it was transitional yeah. for me. Um, you know, what happened was I, I, I kind of fell away from going to church. I remember I was, it was like 1985. It was, it was before that. Anyways, Game Seven of the World Series. Okay, and all I could think about was the fact that <laughs> I, I had, I was going to mass out of obligation. Yeah, when I really wanted to be watching the ball game. Gotcha. And then the priest got up there. He goes. We're not going anywhere because we're here to worship God mm-hmm. in, in a baseball game. Should, <laughs> and that's, you know, back when yeah. the game seven was a big deal. Yeah. And I wasn't mad about the whole thing, but I thought, okay, I'm listening to people, 
uh, do rote prayer in church. They don't want to be there. They're they're yeah. out of obligation. I want to find myself in a position where, when I go to church, I want to be there. Yeah. And you know, it was a process. But when I met my wife, you know, she had come from a Lutheran background. Mm-hmm. Was going to what is now Mariner's Church in right. Irvine, and she, I was really just trying to. You know, yeah, get, her, get her woo attention, her. woo her. <laughs> yeah. And when she said, do you want to come to church with me? Yeah. You know, bear sure. mind, as a lifelong Catholic, that was her radical. Like, oh, yeah, yeah. You only go to the Catholic yes. church. And then she's asked me to go to this community church. Yeah. What is a community yeah. church? You know what I mean? Yeah. And I had I had a great time. It was great, to, but I had the Catholic guilt, so I felt like I needed, after that service, go to real church. <laughs> you know what I mean? Go to, go to confession, yeah. confess you were at a community church? Yeah, kind of, kind of. <laughs> but... You know, but it brought me back, me back to Christ, and I got I got baptized, and um, you know, I still go to mass from time to time. Yeah. But you know, we we go to Saddleback now. It's it's two miles from our house. Yeah. And you know, there's just I I've, I've, I've liked the process of going from somebody who um, had always addressed Christ in as a friend or yeah. you know yeah. someone who's always there for yeah. me to somewhere where, where I feel comfortable now praying in front of him. I can. You know, pray in front of people at the drop of a hat. I used yeah. to be very embarrassed yeah. about doing that because yeah. it was such a private thing. Right. And you know, and, and talk about God. I don't. It used to be, you know, talking about faith. Faith is such a, a secret yeah. thing. It was like it's between oh, me know, and God. Leave it alone. Yeah, leave it alone. <laughs> Watch my actions. But I don't, I'll, I'll talk about it with yeah. anybody. I'm not gonna. Yeah. You know. You know, gun to my head. I'll talk about Christ sure. all day long. Yeah. You know. Does that? That's a, so an interesting question that we can kind of tangent into. Does that? Does that? In your industry, does it is it a big deal? Do people not care? Is it, I mean, because I know in some industries, man, you could get blackballed for just saying that you know you like God or being a Christian. But I mean, it's like you know, I don't know. Yeah. I mean, I'm at the point now. I'm 58 now. Yeah. <laughs> if, if people want to blackball me, go ahead. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, You know what I mean. So it doesn't it's, really alter kind of your day to day. or care. You know what you I mean. I, I think the difference is, you know, I think people get blackballed when they. Get fanatical about it, yeah. You know they or unreasonable, or yeah, just, yeah. You know, you know, or they don't respect people. They yeah. don't respect people of other faith, yeah. And they try to ram it down people's throats. You know, yeah. I'll talk about it. If people want to talk about it. Sure. I don't care if they don't want to talk about <laughs> it. Why, why bring it up? Yeah. I mean, it's yeah. if you're in a business, in in that business is not focused around Christ. Oh, absolutely. You, you know, yeah. Why why be? Yeah, absolutely. I think, yeah, whatever you, your business. I think it, your your number one job is to do your yeah. job well. <laughs> but, oh, yeah. true. Yeah. I was just curious if there was ever ever been a time where someone's asked you to maybe even write something, and you're like, well, I don't want to write that because it doesn't gel with who I am, or or even other. Or is it? Yeah, I, some people might get that. I mean, I I work in an industry where I'm large. Like the product I put out is driven by what comes from inside me. Yeah. You know, I, I don't work in like in a descriptive world, for instance, where yeah. someone's going to come to me and say, "Okay, we're going to we're going to do this scene with Christ, but Christ is going to be a superhero, right? right you know, right, he has magical right, powers, and, right? You know, I'm, I'm, right. not, I'm not in that position. Yeah, so it all yeah. really comes. You get yeah. to write what 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 you want to write. So how did it all how did it all start? I mean, did you always want to be a writer? So the story goes that when I was very young, uh, maybe six years old, um, I. You know, I was, I was, you know, I was kind of a well balanced kid. Yep. You know, I played catch, I played little league, all this yep. stuff. But I was also a complete nerd when it came to reading. Yeah, loved to read. And I came to my my mom one day and I said, "Mom, you know, six years old." I'm, I said, "I'm going to be a writer." Hmm. And she said to me, "Well, don't be silly. Writers don't make any money." Okay. And so that was, it's like, okay, I'm not going to be a writer. <laughs> I'm going <gonna>, <laughs> to do anything. That. I'm going to do anything yeah. else except be yeah. a writer. And so, so it. I took my time getting through college, largely because. I didn't really know what I wanted to do when I got yeah. done. So what I would do is I would actually go to 6th Street in Newport Beach. I get a beach chair and two bottles of Molson, and, and I get a big Hemingway book or Hunter S. Thompson. And instead of going to class, I would read. And I would dream about, man, wouldn't it be cool to be a writer? But, of course, we can't be a writer yeah. because that's, there's yeah, no future. You're never going to make any money. And then, uh, so I, got a, I finally graduated, yep. got a corporate job. I was married, and I came home every day. I was miserable. Uh. And my wife said, just please, just figure this out. Yeah. And so um, I went to see a career counselor in hmm. uh, Pam, somebody, I can't remember her name, but I wrote a check for 350 bucks that we did not have. Okay. You know, just, she had me take all these tests and I came back a week later and, and of course she said, have you ever thought about being a writer? Wow. wow. <laughs> so, so that's how I've been yeah. So I, I started off doing um, just, you know, things just for the byline, like no money, you know, writing for running and triathlon publications, Okay. Uh, 50 word articles, 200 word articles and... You know, God has a plan, and I worked my way up 
So I still had yeah. a corporate job, but I worked my way oh, up. So you're doing both. So doing you're both. working at the corporate yeah. job. Yeah. So I get up at four o'clock in the morning and write. Whew. You know, that's what it takes. Every that's, every that's, good writer that's right, what gets you up at do. four in the morning. Yeah. <laughs> and let's let's be honest. There, you know, when I got my work done at work, yeah, I was using the corporate computer to. Yeah. Uh, well, yeah. Well, yeah. yeah, you, yeah. You got that's it. fair. You took you it know, home. I'm sure, you're right? doing work. Yeah. Uh, and then I got to a certain point where um, I had worked my way up in the magazine world. So I was writing for Sports Illustrated okay. and GQ and Esquire yeah. and bigger publications. How did you How did you get that stuff? Did you just submit things? Just or hustle. Call just, it's different now. But yeah. But back then, what you would do is, you would have a clipping, you would cut it out, and you would mail it. Oh, to, really? To an, yeah, to an editor with a pitch letter. Huh. And they they would look at it and they would pass judgment on you and whether or not. Of course. <laughs> and they call you, yeah. you know, because you know there was no email. Right. It was you know this was the early nineties. I guess there was email. I didn't have email. Right. Um, and then, um, but then they, they, what kind of happened was, it, it, you know, then they give you an assignment. And uh, but I got to the point where in the corporate world I was making as much money writing as I was. Oh wow. In the corporate world. So you were catching up. So it was something like, had something had to give. So well, yeah. Bear in mind, I wasn't making much money in well, the corporate well, world. That's okay, <laughs> yeah. but as long as you're yeah, yeah, because you don't want to just yeah. say, okay, honey, I'm done, and I'm going to yeah. be a writer with not. I mean, not I mean. Yeah. That would be foolish in, in a sense, but I mean, yeah. so you did the smart thing. At least you were, you know. Well, oh, you know, I did the responsible thing. Yeah. You know, we. we had, <laughs> I guess we that's had, a better way. We had two smart, kids, yeah. and yeah, you know, you got You got to keep up. You know, it was yeah. just one of those things. But then, you know, one day. Um, I was at work. I got a call from this guy, British accent. He was a salesman, yeah. just through and through. Yeah. And he said, look, I'm taking a team of Navy SEALs. We're going to Madagascar. We're going to compete in a two-week adventure race in the wilderness. And um, I've read all your stuff, and I've sold this story to magazines with you attached as the writer. You've got to come to Madagascar what? with us. Wow. And, and, and so now everybody knows that yeah. that's Mark Burnett. Yeah. You know, Survivor, The yeah. Voice, all those things. Yeah. Um, but at the time, he didn't have two pennies to rub together. He was selling T-shirts really? on Venice Beach. Okay. And, and uh, he sold that idea? He sold people, that idea. Okay. And, you know, so I went home, and I didn't tell my wife, because yeah. I thought, that's stupid. I mean, yeah. how am I going to go to Madagascar yeah. for three weeks? I yeah. can't get off the three weeks. And then she picked up on it. After three or four days, she goes, what yeah. What are you not telling me? Something's, yeah. Something's yeah. up, you know? And uh, I said, well, I got this, this crazy British guy <laughs> called, and he wants me to go to Madagascar. Yeah. And she goes, you've been praying for that call for five years. Okay, mm. it's not going to come again. That's awesome. And so, went to Madagascar, had the time of my life. Yep. I was a professional journalist. You know, temperatures were 125 degrees. So, what did you take? Did you take pen and paper, or did you have a laptop? I mean, nope. you, no. just had a notebook and you know. Just and you're just taking notes the whole time. Took notes for three and, for three weeks. Yeah. And know? so, the assignment was what though? So, you're going to go and take notes and write a book about this eventually? No, no. Write, write magazine stories. Okay. You know, I had a you know outside runners world. Okay. I had a three or four different assignments. Gotcha. You know, it, it, yeah. So it was. Now, it, was it this the first survivor, or was it? It wasn't. It wasn't called that yet, or anything. No, that it was, was a whole other thing. That was a race called the Raid Go Was. Okay. So Mark wasn't in TV yet. Okay. But he was just going to do this race as an entree yeah. into that world. Yeah. So he, you know, they, they, it was being filmed and it became a documentary yeah. of sorts. Okay. Uh, but I got home from that thing and then uh, my boss, the first day back, fired me for, <laughs> for taking three weeks off, even though he'd given me permission. <laughs> sure. But yeah. instead of being upset, I was, I was yeah. thrilled. Yeah. It was like, you know, and I went home yeah. and told my wife, hey, I got fired. Yeah. And she was like, all right, well, we got two kids. you got to <laughs> yeah. make this. If you're going to do the writing thing, you got to make it yeah. work. Yeah. So she's through thick and thin. I mean, she's been. That's amazing. She, yeah. You know, when people would say to her, like, you know, why would you let Marty, like, be such a dreamer and, yeah. you know, chase his dream? Yeah. And she says, no, this is what he's meant to do. Yeah. Well, he's good at it. Too. Yeah. It's not like you're just off there like American Idol. And I wasn't and can't good sing. in the corporate world. I was, yeah. I was yeah. not. Just right, you, were, you weren't for made for that. Yeah. I was not made for yeah. that. So, so here we are. Yeah. So, so what happens after the Madagascar thing? So you come back and then you you present articles and they're and they're they're. Take... I sold articles and okay. then, then you know, I just get on the phone. You know, and like again, yeah. you know, email was by this time was kind of coming. Sure. Thing, you know, you know, frantically. So, 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 so you're just, back hitting it and trying just, to get yep. get pitch, jobs, pitching yeah. stories, and you know, juggling, you know, five, six, seven, eight assignments yeah. at the same time. You yeah. know. Traveling, literally traveling halfway. Like somebody would offer me a flight to go cover an event, so I'd fly to China, for instance. Yeah. You know, for for five hundred dollar assignment. Yeah. You know, which is That's, it's a long way to go for yes. five hundred bucks, yeah. but it, you know, it yeah. kept but, us afloat. But they would take expenses and then pay you five hundred bucks, kind yeah. of thing. Yeah. Okay. Well, the so, magazine, yeah. magazine paid me. Okay. Yeah. You know, the the promoters. Yeah. So anyway. Yeah. So then, uh, kind of about nineteen ninety seven, I wrote a first a book on spec. Yep. And 
it got published. Yeah, okay. So what is that? Let's talk about that a little bit, and then we'll come back. What is okay. in the publishing world? Yep. Okay, you're about to write a book, and what yeah. does on spec mean? What does that What does that mean? That means you don't have a book contract. Okay. I mean, no publisher. I didn't have an agent. So you have an idea. You're you're going to write a book, and then give it to somebody. Yes. Okay. And which is kind of crazy. So. And yeah. I didn't. I didn't have an agent. Didn't have anything. I just thought I'm going to write this book. Yep. And I wrote it. You know, in between magazine assignments, yep. I wrote which it. Which book was it? It was the very first. It was actually wasn't my very first book because okay. I was like Sports Illustrated to have me write a, a kid's book. Okay. <laughs> well, I didn't know that. I yeah, didn't know it's that. It's out there. Okay. You know, and then uh, there's other people have me write a book called uh, Inline Skating Made Easy. You just yeah. you write it because it's a okay. check. You know, yeah, yeah. it's what you got to do. Okay. And the, co- the cool thing about that book was I had to provide all the photos, so all the like the model for the. The inline yeah. skating was my wife. Was your wife? And, you know, <laughs> my kids are all in there. Yeah, they all got so, really good at it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's a terrible book. Yeah, I just uh, I BS the whole yeah, thing. Yeah, I yeah. don't inline skate. Yes, I just I, but I skateboarded. Yeah, I used to be a skateboarder, yep. so I just used the skateboarding principles. And, and and wrote a book, and they thought it was really good. Yeah. They published it. Yeah, if I ever get an inline skating, I'll be don't, sure to pick. Don't be, use I, that. I, I won't. Don't I'll, use I'll, I'll don't use it. So uh, so then okay. So the spec book was what? Which one? Which okay, one? so it's the the final title was uh, Surviving the Toughest Race on Earth. Okay, okay, and that was the book that got me into the publishing. Okay, world. so so again with the the same adventure race that Mark Burnett had done right. in Madagascar, right. I competed in that race. In 96, 97, or 98. Okay. In, you know, and and yeah. I wrote a book about those experiences. Gotcha. Um, got turned down by 19 publishers yeah. before it finally found a home at McGraw yeah. Hill. And then, um, so that led to, you know, through that I got an agent. Yeah. You know, then I did, started doing, uh, did a couple other, did a sailing book about a tragedy in right. Australia. But then I got right. into history. And history was my sweet spot. So, was that something that you wanted to do, always a connection, or did it just come dawn you know, on you and like, huh, I, you know, I it, really like the research part and I'm digging in? So, so the weird thing is is that um, the first history of book I did was about Captain James Cook, right. legendary British navigator. Right. And I didn't know this, but when I was a little kid, like uh, five or six, there was a book of like kids' books about famous explorers. Yeah. And I, it my, sunk in. <laughs> I had no, I had a kids' book yeah. by Captain James Cook, and I had actually signed my name in the book. Oh, like, that's amazing! You know, I love whatever like yeah. you know. Yeah. So I still have that book. Yeah. It's kind of crazy. That's, that's amazing. Yeah. You that's, signed it like you wrote it? No, I signed it like it's mine. You know, oh, like I see, in, I see. Yeah. Just inside, like you know, Martin Duke. You know, yeah, yeah. You know it, it yeah. was not. You know, it was ch- a child's it's, handwriting. Yeah, but the connection so, was there, and then your your, your yeah. first history book was on that. That's that's pretty interesting. So when, yeah, when you write history, you get to research. You get to put your hands on you know documents. That are hundreds of years yeah. old, you know, you get to travel because yep. you got to go to these places. Yep. Um, and you so that's all. Is that all? Yeah. That's all built into these types of contracts. When the publisher goes, "Hey, Marty, we we greenlight this book." Is that, is, yeah. Do they call it greenlighting in that business? Like they no. do? No. It's they like, just say, "Here's, you're it. here's a contract." Yeah, okay. The so then there's a contract. They pay yeah. for the travel. You write the book, and and do you get no uh, no you, no, they, no? What happens is you sign a contract, and you get it's usually broken into fourths. Okay. So you get it. You get one fourth for signing the contract, okay. agreeing to write the book. Right. Okay, so all your travel expenses, everything has to come out of that money. Okay, so you got to make that last. Okay, you know, and then you get another one upon acceptance of the book when you turn in the manuscript. Okay, and they say, "All right, it's good. We like it. Yep. We're going to publish it." They send you the other fourth. Okay, then you get the next fourth on publication. Okay, and then you get the final fourth on paperback publication. Okay, so you you've got to. You got to make that's, it work that's because, a lot. because you, from you the time have you three sign or four it, books going to get exactly the the yeah. hundred percent that you need you yeah. know, out of the whole thing. But do um, they so, now? What happens if one goes nuts? Is that in the contract that if it sells oh, 10, yeah. 10 well, 20, you know? So you have you have an advance. Yeah. So let's say they you know give you hundred bucks. Yeah. Okay. So um, there is a rate that built into your contract that if you sell for every book you sell out of okay. that you you earn back that advance. So in the rate is okay. usually like so once you beat the advance you're making you can they, make money. That's when you get royalty checks. Okay, that's when you get royalty checks. Goal. Okay, that's the goal. So there's two strategies: either you you get such a big advance <laughs> that you don't care, yeah. that you're never going to earn yeah. out, or yeah. you get you kind of get an average advance, hoping that you hit a home run. Yeah. and you sell you know a lot. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, because when you think of when you and I think of Stephen King or John Grisham or yeah. you know you know Kuntz or all these guys, you're like, well. I mean, you've had bestsellers, New York sure. Times bestsellers. Like, why aren't you driving a Ferrari? You know, it's like, yeah. so there's differences in yeah. uh, types of work, obviously. But then there's contracts based yeah. on who you are. 
and then how many you sell, I guess, is like, the, sure. is that the, that's the big thing, right? I mean, that's when you're selling thing. 40 million copies. You want to sell, and, you yeah, sell yeah, books. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, and plus, too, I think there's a lot to be said, though, for making the money and not driving the Ferrari. Right. Well, well you know yeah. I mean? yeah. 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 Not for Bub. Yeah, yeah, I brought the Ferrari. The Ferrari yeah, yeah. Not, I, hey, I, do you know when you, uh, you know, like you said, the inline skating book was was you know was a hit. Yeah, and you said it sucked. So, do you know when you hit a home run when you're writing it? Are you aware? Oh yeah. Do you? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Like with the Killing books, I mean, those are easy because back when Bill used to be on the air, I mean, we were selling two to three million dollars, two to three million, million books, books yeah. per book. Yeah, we'd be on the New York Times list. We'd be number one on the New York Times list for. Like thirty weeks. Yeah, I mean, and, or you know, the, my favorite thing is when you you got on an airplane and the person next to you is reading your book. Uh, absolutely. Oh, yeah. Well, that's where I see. Has that most... happened to you? Yeah. Oh yeah. Oh really? That's yeah. cool. Well, I used to send you pictures. Yes. Remember when yeah. I went in the airport? I'm like, <laughs> you know, like, here you are. Yeah. Send yeah. you pictures. And so. yeah, the weird thing is, is like when someone is reading the book. Like as authors, you love to watch people lovingly. Yeah. You know, <laughs> yeah. But, when, your but book. when they put their little bookmark in and they put it away, it's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Yeah. What, what, what made you stop? Yeah. You know, oh. was it? Were you bored? Yeah. Are you yeah. just, you know, are you just T- tired? Fatigued. But what made you stop <laughs> yeah. reading my lovely words? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, <laughs> that's what happened. So, how did the so let's talk about that? How did the whole connection with you and and Bill happen? It was another God thing. It really was. Okay, so in two thousand seven and two thousand eight, as the economy just cratered, yeah. the publishing industry just collapsed. Yeah. You know, so for a guy who makes his living in the book world, writing history books and you know, you know, sports book every now and then. And all of a sudden, uh, the only books that publishers are doing are like celebrity tell-alls or cookbooks. Yeah. <laughs> I was, you know, I, yeah. we were struggling. Yeah. You know, I put together like six book proposals. None of them hmm. even got a sniff. And so I was up in Mammoth with my cross-country team and just trying to figure out how we're going to, what are the next steps going to be? I mean, yeah. I'm probably a few weeks away from frozen foods at, yeah. you know, at working nights at pavilions. And yeah, that's scary. I, I got a call from my agent, and he said, I've got a client who'd like to meet you. Can you be in New York day after tomorrow? And I said, sure. Uh, yeah, okay. Yeah. So I drove through the night to Reno, got on a, 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 you know, got on a plane, flew to New York, and you know, the, the client turned out to be Bill. And we sat down, and we had lunch, and you know, he's a very tall guy, very imposing. Yeah. Yep. Looked me in the eye the whole time, just judging me, <laughs> sizing me up. And uh, he's, he's a super cool guy. Yeah. But I was terrified. Yeah, you know. Um, but he knew your work. Apparently, you wouldn't even have the meeting. He right? read some of my yeah. stuff. Yeah, and then uh, so and so the book was going to be killing Lincoln, and that was going to be a one-off. We were just going right. to do this because the, his publisher at the time didn't think he could do history. Okay, he, they thought he was just going to do politics. Right. Right. You know, and our books are pure history. Sure, there's, there's no politics yeah. in them. So, um, so he basically said, "Okay, you're the guy." You know, and so I went back to Mammoth, coached the rest of the week. You know, wrote. Yep. You know, or kind of researched about half of it, gave him a rough narrative right. about how I thought it should look. And and he, he you know, said, this is great. Yep. And we, then he rewrote it, you know, with, with his voice, okay. you know, asking for sure. additional research. Sure. That, that began how, how we work our collaboration. Okay. You know, you know, I'll research, I'll put together a rough narrative. Bill gets the narrative, rewrites it in his voice. Sure. And it will say to me, like, we need more of this, less okay. of this, come back. And then we're on the phone Back and forth, yeah. we literally go over every line of the manuscript every time we talk. That's crazy. You know, it's, it's, yeah, yes, yeah, it, but it's worked. It's, yeah, we're ten years in. Yeah, and I so you're a decade in. Yeah, so that's right. Well, it's, so sign, then, it's short shorthand now. You guys know each other, and you're you're pretty good at it, or better at it. I say. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, no, it's it's to the point where, you know, it, it, so when we review the manuscript, yeah. you know, it's oh, the master is kept on my computer. Okay, so. I carry my computer with me wherever I go because he'll call me and say, hey, what are you doing? Do you want to work? It's like, sure, sure. why not? All right, I, I might be, you yeah, know, unless I'm, store. unless I'm at Church of the Movies, <laughs> yeah. you know, it's like, you know, so I'm, I'm you know, grocery store parking, yeah. track meets, sure. you know, <laughs> yeah. I'm, you know, airports, yeah. you know, and I've, I've taken, uh, we did the closing lines of Killing the Rising Sun. Yeah. I was in a hotel bathroom in Guam, uh, just on our way back from, Having visited yeah. Japan, but I didn't want to wake my wife up because, you know, for for Bill it was you know five yeah, in the afternoon. Yeah. For me it was five in the morning. Yeah. So to do the work, I literally pulled Picked a chair up. into the bathroom. That's so hilarious. That's how these books get written. Yeah. Yeah. So here that, we are. That's that that's so that's amazing. That's uh. So let's move into uh, Killing Jesus, which yeah. I want to talk about more specifically. What what 
when you guys sat around and talked, did, was there a list of lots of people that you wanted to cover? I mean, because after you wanted to do a one-off, yeah, but then it became successful. And like, hey, we can do a series of these killing yeah. things. And was Jesus always on the list, or was there? Did it, did you no. bring it up? Does he no, bring it up? So Bill does the yeah. the ideas, and he so killing Lincoln was kind of like, all right, you know, Lincoln, yeah, it's it's a thing, yeah. And then he when that a month after that just shot to the top of the yeah. bestseller list, he called me and he goes. We're going to do a second one. You ready? Killing Kennedy. I go, oh, man, yeah. we are stepping into it. I yeah. mean, this is, yeah. okay. Well, that's all right. the holy grail of that. We, we, <laughs> yeah, we, we, we can't mess this yeah. up. You know, so, and that's when the research started getting very sharp. Yeah. Because also we realized it's got to be Yeah, people are perfect. maybe looking at this yeah. from every angle, yeah. And then Kennedy did, did well, you know, once again, number one. Yep. And he calls me, he goes, all right. He goes, I just came, came back from mass. Yep. You ready for this? Yeah. I go, well, killing Jesus. I go, oh, man, yeah. they're going to hate us. <laughs> yeah. They're going to kill yeah. us. I mean, we're yeah. going to, you know, and it was so luckily I've got uh, I've got a good, very good friend, Don Smedley, who uh, is an apologist. He's on, he works at Yale University. Yep. And I called Don right away. Yep. I said, tell me about the historical Jesus. Yep. And most people don't know this, that within the framework of modern theology, there, is, there are a group of scholars who just work on the historical yes. Jesus. Yes. And, you know what he, you know what was it like with Roman times, all right. those kind of things. Right. And he gave me a list of resources, like ten to yeah. fifteen, the the best books, yeah, the best books. And I read them all, and I put them all in the bibliography. And yep. matter of fact, one of the scholars later said, "I was really ready to slam your book." That I realized that I was one of your sources. Ah, uh, yeah. So it worked uh, out, hey, easy. Worked out very well for <laughs> I quoted us. you. Yeah. But to me, it was it was to me it was a revolution revolutionary book to read yeah. because in addition to just you know, just history books, you know, about the Romans yeah. and traveling to Jerusalem and, you know, going to the Garden of Gethsemane, yeah. you know, actually walking down the, the the place that Jesus would have ridden, as, you know, on Palm Sunday when he yeah. came into, I mean, just actually yeah. literally you walking in Jesus' footsteps, life-changing. Yeah. But the thing about it is, is, is my, my NIV version study Bible yeah. was one of my resources yeah. because the history in there is spot on, yeah. except I'm still not sure... Like in, in the Gospels, Jesus turning over the money changers things happened in two different places. Right. You know, so I'd like to, when to I get to exactly. him, I'm going to talk, yeah. I'm going to yeah. ask God ask, about yeah. Yeah. The yeah. one question I want to have answered. The yeah. thing about it is the spiritual warfare was very real. Yeah. You know, praying at the start of every day became a necessity. But but also um, the fact that, you know, all the pain and trauma that went into making that book yeah. as tight as it could be yeah. from a research point of view. And when I got done... You know, I didn't open my Bible for like a year. Yeah. Because opening the Bible was just like going and back more, and yeah, reliving, work, 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 yeah. you know, yeah, all yeah. the spiritual warfare. Yeah. yeah. But um, that's interesting. But in the end, yeah. it was just such a profound book to write. Yeah. Well, I can imagine. I mean, yeah. this is this is not just a history book. This is your savior. Yeah. I mean, this is. Yeah. But here's the thing: when you write history, yeah. Uh, whether you write about Henry Morton Stanley or John F. Kennedy, you learn everything about that person. Yeah. Everything. Yeah. So. They become kind of your buddy. Yeah. Okay. Like you're, yeah. like so you're closer and closer you, to them. You're like, like you're, you're talking to them every day. Every day. <laughs> right. Yeah. If they walk into my office, if Henry Morton Stanley, yeah. an African explorer, hey <laughs> was to walk in, yeah. I go, hey, dude, hey, yeah, yeah, you know, let's I chat again. Yeah. I knew everything about him. That's amazing. So Jesus became that person. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I was like, Jesus and I were, we have never been more tight. That's amazing. It was just yeah. one of those things yeah. where it, I knew. I knew what it was like for him growing up. Yeah. You know, I could imagine him walking through the crowd. They wanted to throw him off the cliff. All these things. So I'll never forget this. It was Easter Sunday. We were in church, and people were singing songs to mm, Jesus. Yeah. And I was like, this is not right. That is my best friend. Right. And all you people think, no, you do not know him like, yeah. like I do. Yeah. And it was... It was, yeah. it was you got a little jealousy there. It was there. a little yeah. jealousy. Yeah. It was like, yeah. I thought, okay, I'm being a freak. Yeah, that's but a little weird, but, that's, it's but like, I get it. But well, I mean, what a, what a, what a lesson for uh, believers uh, yeah. to, to uh, immerse yourself into Christ at that level. Yeah. Every day yeah. obviously changes you. Well, the thing about it is, too, I mean, you can appreciate the miracles. You can appreciate all everything, yep. you know, the whole ministry, yep. you know, just to know the whole story. But um, to know it from a historical Jesus yep. point of view, yep. it, actually, it, it, and it sounds weird, but when you take the spiritual aspect of it up and mm-hmm. you make it just a real nuts and yeah. bolts, yeah. he was just a dude. the reality. Yeah. yeah. Um, it makes it much more approachable. Yeah. You don't feel like... You're dealing with the deity. You're dealing with who he was at the time, which yeah. was, 
you know, God fully human, fully yeah, human, yeah, yeah. And, and that's the side that we can only yeah. see, right? We, the, the spiritual one is yeah. it's difficult to see. Although his his lessons were on that. Sure. But no, I, I agree with you. When I the more I dig in to the basics of what what we see in rea- and, and and what we can perceive anyway, because I actually believe that there's the supernatural and there's miracles. Sure. I didn't see them, you know, but I but. But when I when I ground it out and go, well, he actually walked in this place, and there's the name of that guy, and there's that ring that he touched, and that's the place that he knocked over, and yeah. you ground it all. This is actually God walking on. Or there he is, yeah, right there. It, it actually it's, it's makes it much more palpable. You can, like you said, you can just grab onto it. It makes it more realistic and takes uh, away the other stuff. What was the what was the thing? Was there anything super surprising that when you researched that it lined up uh, like beautifully with the Bible, or it didn't? And you're like, man, that's other than the, you know, a couple of those. No, what re, what blew my mind was how historically authentic the the scriptures are. Yeah, you know, the Gospels are. If you look at them, and then you you start laying that over yeah. with known yeah. facts about yeah. the time. Yeah, it, it's it's not it's, just, it's not mumbo jumbo. Yeah. It's it's history. Yeah, you know, and in I think a lot of people can't wrap their head around miracles, but, you know, we it's been said many times, we can't see, you know, Gravity. stuff, stuff yeah. flying through the yeah. air, but we know that we watch TV and right. pictures That's come on. You pretty know, miraculous. And <laughs> we don't know how emails get from one yeah. place to another, but they happen right yeah. away. So I don't think every miracle can easily be explained, but I think they're legit. Absolutely. There's I, there's a guy that I think just named Greg Kinnear. I think that's, I may, something Kinnear. He wrote a whole like tome on, on miracles and modern oh, yeah. day miracles, like there's oh, nice. thirty thousand of them or something, yeah. and he put it and there's like, man, the, you know, these doctors will walk in. The guy had you know a tumor in his head. Yeah. And it was all verified and X-rayed, and a day later, after the you know the, yeah. the family came in, they prayed. It's all gone. It's like completely. They're that? like, okay, so it was there, you know, verifiable, falsifiable. And then hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of these yeah. this guys recorded. And well, again, you know, when, it be, when we all get to heaven and, and everything's going to be revealed, it's like it's going to be like these major aha moments. Like, oh, yeah, that's so that, cool. I mean, yeah, that really, really happened. That happened. Okay, I just, <laughs> all right, yeah. all right, okay, we're we're yeah. good on that. Yeah, yeah. So, hey, Marty, that, what a first of all, what an amazing calling, you know, that you got. I mean, we all are called to study, you know, Christ, but to actually get commissioned—that's yeah. a special calling. And what a great privilege that is. You and I were talking before uh, we started about what kind of what God's doing right now and what he's been doing in, in, uh, in your life right now. And I'm kind of curious of what you want to tell us about that. Oh, sure. You know, um, well, you know, like, as I alluded to, uh, in addition to writing, I kind of, I write from about eight to two every, every morning. Mm-hmm. And then for the past 15 years, I, you know, I, in high school and college, I was, uh, competitive distance runner and after that I ran marathons and triathlons and did adventure races so I've always wanted to kind of give back with that so for 15 years um, I've coached high school cross country in track and field mm-hmm. in the afternoon so that's kind of my version of giving back you know I don't yeah. take, I don't take a salary I yeah. just I go because I love to do it and I mean, you know I've had a good run we had a yeah. few championships here and there um, but you know as far back as July my, my mom passed away in July and I just kind of felt like there was a turning point in my life, like mm. things were happening. And it actually, as I go back to my journals for the last six months, a lot, you know, I'd, I'd, I've actually forgotten all the stuff that was going on. You know, but I began praying for God to close the doors that needed to be closed and then open the doors that needed yeah. to be opened. Yeah. And literally, uh, now it's been about a month, but I, so the place that I coached all these years, I was very outspoken as an advocate for my program and it, and it, Offended some people, okay. who, you know, who, <laughs> who yeah. think, people who think cross country <clears throat> should know their place. Yeah, okay. gotcha. Sure. Yeah, you know, we're just it's always those struggles. Well, compared to football, compared, there's, always, right, exactly. yeah, there's yeah. always struggles. And you know, and I'm not anti football. I love yeah. football, sure. but at the same time, they put bleachers on the track during football right. season because they're trying to create a stadium. Right. They put outhouses on the track, and and I was a very vocal, yeah. you know, person. And so basically, in January they just told me that we're not going to renew your contract. You know, basically, you right. can be too outspoken. Right. Okay. And the thing was, I had wanted to leave. You know, yeah. I've been writing about that, but I just didn't know. I wanted it to be on yeah. my, you know. Yeah. Well, you know, look, if you start praying for God to open doors and close doors, he's, probably going he's to gonna yeah. do stuff yeah. like that. Yeah. So, and so I completely blindsided. You know, they let me go. Um, but literally within an hour, two other schools had called to say, we would love to have you come over, coach here. Yeah. And I've, I'm in a much better situation right now. In the place that let me go... First, I was very bitter, very angry. Like hmm. I'm gonna, yeah. you know, revenge. Yeah. 
that was like, man, they did me such a favor. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm in a much better place. Yeah. It, the transition was rough, but at the same time, I love where I am right yeah. now. And just nice. to be able to coach, and I'm completely revitalized as a coach because I was going to kind of maybe hang on for two or three yeah. better more yeah. years. Yeah. And now I can see myself going, let's put it this way, my dad just retired from coaching at the age of 87. Wow. Yeah. That's so 30 got, years now for me. So I, I, I get some coaching. So I'm too. counting, that's twice you've been fired that I, I'm counting over here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, and you know what? That's the thing. Every quarter century I get fired. Yes. Yeah, that's what know. happens. Okay. So you, you only got two more then. Yeah. 1994 yeah. and 2020. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a, that can really do stuff to you. As far as your identity, it, pull, it brushes yeah. you back and you go, wait a second, you know. Well, you think about it. It's not just what you do, it's how you spend your day. You know, where do you park mm. your car? Where do you, where, where's the office you sit in? You know, what time do you go get lunch? All those little things. You get, that's you, true. Those are you, patterns you and have routines. To go, that you, you have to go get. do in a new yeah, place. Yeah, that's and so it, true. It's weird at it first. It is weird. You know? Yeah. But it's the shakeup that I think that actually yeah. invigorates you, right? It, it's, God has a way of shaking it up and not letting you be complacent and, and moving on. And, and Yeah, I hate, to, I hate to say that I love it because... In, who knows what he's got? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What's next? Yeah. Well, but, uh, well, you know he loves you, right? So yeah. that's at least you're like, I know you love me and you're doing this the best for yeah. me. I, at least I can hold on to that promise. Yeah. It may feel horrible. It may look ugly. I right. may not even like it at all. But at least there's that little piece of like, I know you're doing this for yeah. some reason that, to bring you glory and to benefit me. I think yeah. I think we all, at, at varying points in our life, we get to a place where we start to either coast yeah. or we don't yeah. or we don't aspire anymore. Yep. And I, I was kind of getting there. Yeah. It was like, I got it pretty good. I write these books. Uh, I coach these teams. You know, we're good. We're just, we're just going to yeah. maintain. And now I feel like God is saying, you, well, you're not done. Yep. So you need to you need to step it up and you need to challenge yourself and, you know, suffer a little bit. and you know, <laughs> you Suffer know, some more. Suffer yeah. some more. Yeah. But that you know that's how we that's how we get to that's, where we're gonna go. That's where you grow. So that, Mar Marty, I, I think I asked you this once before. You did some work with Mark Burnett, and my favorite thing about him, all of his stuff is very tribal, and you got that one sentence. Yep. Right. So you must have written, "You're fired," right? <laughs> did you I write that not, one? I did not. Or the tribe has spoken. I, I or which the, one did you write? I worked. <laughs> I, were, I worked on the first season of Survivor, and I literally was. Um, one of the stand-ins at the first tribal council. Oh. And Probst was trying to think of what to say, yeah. like, how are we going to do it? And there was a, a back and forth, and it may have, I'm not sure who threw it out there, but I was part of that back and forth, and finally it was like, oh, the tribe has spoken, you know? Yeah. And a lot of the, the lingo on Survivor, just to be there to contribute early on and, and to be part of it just that first year was super cool. Because, um, yeah, because Mark called me in 2000 and said, you know, I'm doing this TV show, and the, the writer who's going to do the companion book just quit, and I need a writer. But the thing is, you have to leave, you know, like now, because yeah. we, we start filming on Monday. Wow. And I said, all right, sure. And so I flew over there, and it was like six weeks of adult um, day camp. I didn't wear shoes. <laughs> and we lived on the, I felt like Huck Finn, you know? Yeah. Literally, I didn't wear shoes for six weeks. If we wanted to go see the castaways, they were, they were just on the other side of the island. On our side of the island, we had... You know, they just lived in huts. We had, you know, uh, cable TV. We had, uh, you know, pirated movies from Hong Kong that we brought in to, <laughs> oh. to watch. Um, we had a bar. We had, they would helicopter in McDonald's once a week in addition oh, to the so food. It was had. easy to yeah. survive then. Yeah. For, well, for us, for it was you. great. We, <laughs> just you know, the terrible people. Were, were, yeah, the, the, the terrible times that the other people were going through. You know, it was fun. You're we'd, fine. We'd, we'd walk over to the other side of the island and they're starving and. I'd be eating Skittles and having, <laughs> having a Diet Coke. And they, the look of like uh, contempt. hatred. Contempt. Yeah. Contempt is a better word. Yeah. Yeah. Now, yeah. did they write those backwards? Because I had a buddy who worked in reality TV. Yeah. And he goes, we kind of shoot everything. And then we pull that in and kind of kind of do writing around that. Is that how that works? So there is a daily production meeting. Um, probably, I think, 8 o'clock in the morning, 9 o'clock in the morning to review everything that has come in over the previous day and, and just to basically flesh out the storylines. Mm -hmm. And then in the editing process literally goes on as everything is being shot. So, so mm -hmm. there was a big open air work area. So I wrote on a, you know, just a roof. It was in the tropics, just a roof, but no walls. And so I just wrote, set up this big table and wrote, um, the, the editors were inside air conditioned editing bays mm -hmm. that were part of this whole thing. So, <laughs> Stuff would come, and they would just start breaking it down right away. It was it was a fascinating process. Wow, that's pretty awesome. Yeah, uh, 
to do this thing. I'm, we're just we just started with you. Okay. It's, it's, oh, I'm oh. call it rapid connections. We're okay. going to throw you questions out, and you're going to say something so the audience can connect with you or disconnect okay. with you. By the way, Hopefully I want to yeah. point out that we are. I don't know how far we're into this, but yeah. uh, have not dropped an f bomb yet. That's no. good. Last no. time I dropped an f bomb, so you I did. did. I was, I'm on my okay. best. That's so why maybe that's why this whole thing didn't happen. Yeah. That's still growing to do, Mark. You're still growing to do. If you do drop an f bomb. You're fired. Yeah. <laughs> That's good. That's yeah. good. That's clear. Uh, who who is your uh, favorite author? I'd say either Hemingway or Hunter S. Thompson. Yeah. Why those two? Hemingway, I like the spare prose. Hunter S. Thompson, I like the fact that he is so audacious. Yeah. And um, and he walks out that line between fact and fiction. You don't know yeah. what is what. Yeah. Who's your favorite musical artist? Bruce Springsteen. Everybody knows that. Everybody, I know that. Yeah. Uh, like, why Springsteen? What I mean, he's a storyteller. He's, a, he's You know, I began listening to Springsteen when I was in high yeah. school, and his music has evolved. He's not writing high school lyrics as a 70-year-old man. He's right. he's writing, right. you know, the lyrics. Have, as he has grown, his audience has grown, yeah. and I'm proud to be part of that audience. Wow, that's awesome. Yeah. What, okay, a little, little different now. Who's your favorite actor or actress? Ooh, that's pretty good. I don't know. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw out a name, and then I'm going to... Qualified, qual- you know, but then I, if, um, then I'm going to drive away and go. Oh, oh yeah, sure. So let's just say Matt Damon. I oh, like Matt. Damon. Nice. Yeah. 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 Uh, I, was, I, I was expecting someone like from a generation before. Okay. So one thing I didn't count on. So Somebody hold on. You? Hold on, everyone. Wait, yeah. It's a phone call. Yeah. Stand by. I have a question for you. Yes. How many times have you been fired? Uh. I would say, you know, there were, there were some fast food jobs, you know, early, like high school. You know, I, was, I, uh, I was, uh, I worked on a golf course in Laguna Niguel as a kid. I think I was only 15, and I, my job was to drive the sodas and the snacks to the little pop-up stands that were on this oh, yeah. tournament. And I was tearing that thing up, setting up, and unbeknownst to me, one of the owners of the whole course was watching me drive around, <laughs> and I was fired before I yeah. even got yeah, back yeah. to the thing. Yeah. So yeah. I don't think I've ever been fired. I've been laid off a lot, a lot of times. Yeah. So I, I, I'll use that. I'll act like that's better than being fired. It's all, <laughs> it's all the same. Uh, do this thing that you know we do. It's called One Thing in One Minute, except we okay. switched it up. It's uh, I just want, it, in your field, I want you to just kind of look and encourage anybody that may be doing what you're doing. And oh. what would you say in one minute to them? Uh, it doesn't take one minute. It, if Nine you, seconds at them. And... If you want to be a writer, you have to write. It's that simple. And you can't let anybody distract you. You can't let anybody tell you you're not worthy or that you suck. You have to just sit down and you have to write. And it's a daily discipline. It's like training for a marathon. You have to run every day. When you write, you have to write every day. And don't be afraid. Don't ignore that little voice you know, inside your head that tells you you're not good enough. But just keep writing. Love it. Thanks. All right, brother. It was fun. Thanks, Marty. All right. right. See you guys. Adios.